Okay, it's a new year, we have some cool new equipment, and it's winter time in Seattle, when the rain, rain, rain came down, down, down in rushing, rising rivulets. And if you recognize that reference, you're as big a nerd as I am. It's cold and wet outside, so it's a good time to stay inside and continue our look at Tom Clancy's successful series, Splinter Cell. Today's subject is Splinter Cell Conviction. I'm Irving, and I have no life, just like you. The Ballad of Irving. Irving. Big Fat Irving. Big Sport Irving. The 142nd fastest gun in the West. I have to admit, after the mess that Ubisoft made of Splinter Cell Double Agent for the Xbox 360, I wasn't sure what to expect with this one. I hoped it would just start a story and not try to harken back to anything except the death of Sam's daughter, Sarah. No such luck. The controls have been revamped a lot. So is the visual interface. The way the game puts things like objectives, potential cover, people's names and such directly onto objects in the environment is kind of cool, but too often it's hard to read. Sacrificing readability for coolness is not a good trade-off. And too often, when there's text on the screen, like in the tutorial, where you're being told which button does what, the text is impossibly small and you can't see it without mashing your nose onto the screen. I thought maybe it was just my eyes, which I admit aren't the best in the world, but I talked with three other people who have pretty good eyes, and they had the same problem. So it wasn't just me. That made me feel better, but didn't make the game any easier to work with. Another thing I'm not crazy about is the use of so-called adult language. We've seen it in other games like Fear, but I still don't like it. I know the developers are trying to go for realism, but previous games in the Splinter Cell series have made it clear that you can tell a good story, have a successful franchise, and make an excellent product without it. So it's unnecessary. And there's going to be some in these clips. I can't avoid it. So be aware, and if you're sensitive about that kind of thing, brace yourself. I'll try to keep it to a minimum. Still, it's Splinter Cell. It's Sam Fisher, and the graphics look pretty awesome. So here we go. The game opens with this. Just do what you have to do. I always do, Sam. I always do. She's a little hard to recognize with the new graphics, but that's his old friend, Anna Grimm's daughter, or Grimm as everyone calls her, because Americans can't say Grimm's daughter without picturing something out of Norse mythology. At first, it looks like we're going to have another Bioshock 2 that apparently begins with the main character getting killed. But a graphic has already told us this is taking place 74 hours from now. Uh, run that by me again? Now we see some guy talking to some other guys, telling the story of what happened to Sam. Here's the biggest thing I don't like. He tells them that Sam's daughter was killed by a drunk driver, then Sam basically went renegade and wound up killing his best friend, Irving Lambert. He says Lambert died by Sam's hand, and Sam died that day too. The Sam Fisher we knew was gone for good. The scenario with Lambert comes from the Xbox 360 version of Double Agent. In the good version of Double Agent, the one for the original Xbox, Sam had to make a decision about exposing Lambert as a spy, knowing that the bad guys would kill him. The game branched different ways depending on what you, the player, decided. In the Xbox 360 version, Sam was given a pistol with one bullet in it. Lambert was tied to a chair and pretty well beaten to a pulp. The bad guys told Sam to kill him. Thing is, you could choose not to and shoot the bad guy instead. This game just assumes that A, you played the Xbox 360 version, and B, you chose to kill Lambert. As if I'm going to kill somebody named Irving. Get real! I suppose, for the sake of story arc, they had to decide on a scenario and go with it, regardless of what players did in the previous game. But for those of us who made a different choice, it's a little frustrating. And really, it wasn't necessary to choose just one scenario. Games like Mass Effect and Fable have what are called carryover saves, which means the next game is directly affected by the decisions you made in the previous game. Why couldn't they do that here? 
they had the chance to sell not just one game, but two. These guys really blew it. I'm not convinced that the Sam Fisher in that game, even in the depths of despair where he was, would have chosen the mission over friendship. But this is the direction the writers chose to go, so I guess I should practice my own mantra and just go with it. We learn that Sam heard stories about his daughter's death, especially that it might not have been an accident. He follows the rumors to a particular town when out of the blue he gets a phone call from Grimm. She tells him there's a truckload of hostels headed his way, so he needs to move now. The tutorial begins. We're taken through the basic controls, including how to take cover, a very nice new addition, how to move from one cover to another, how to aim and fire and reload, and the new mark and execute maneuver. We learn this as part of a flashback to Sarah's childhood. Now that's cool. The flashback ends and we get to use it in real life, so to speak. To get the ability to mark and execute, you have to perform a hand-to-hand -hand kill, so here goes. I keep working for this guy. His money's good. He's a punk. Granko should be running his operation and hiring him out, not the other way around. Gramcoast doesn't think so. Coben says frog, Gramcoast hops. And I never seen Gramcoast do that for nobody. Oh, man. <laughs> You finish taking out all the bad guys except their leader. You want to interrogate him and find out who sent him and why. So you follow him into a public restroom and start asking questions. You remember the interrogation stuff from the previous games? Well, Sam's methods have gotten a little more intense. No more playing around. Who sent you? Fuck you! Enough. You want to know, send me. It's Coben. Andre Coben. <coughs> Runs drugs, guns. Anything people want, he gets it for them. Not good enough. Why does Coben want me dead? If I talk, he'll kill me. He's crazy. <laughs> He drove the car that hit your daughter. Used to brag about it, you know? Uh, heard you were coming, so he hired me to, to kill you before you killed him. You should refund his money. Where do I find him? I can't tell you. I can't! In the city! The old museum on King George Street. It's his place now. Guards out front and on the sides. Don't tell him I told you. Oh, I'm not going to tell him a damn thing. So we're off to Andre Coben's place to find out what he knows about Sarah. As we get there, we acquire our first gadget. That looked like it hurt his hand. And I hope the sharp edges don't carve up his butt too much. But this is Sam Fisher we're talking about. He's as tough as they come, so maybe he likes having broken mirror scars on his lower cheeks. You never know. One nice thing about this game is the attention to detail. Notice the cracks in the mirror that sometimes distort what you're looking at. This is what you'd expect from a busted side view mirror, and somebody had the presence of mind to include it. I like it.
Of course, I haven't seen too many car side mirrors that can zoom in, but we won't talk about that. Some folks have complained that this isn't really Splinter Cell fair because there's more emphasis on the shoot 'em up aspect and less on the stealth maneuvers that made Splinter Cell so popular. I haven't found that to be the case. Here's a good example. I got past all three of those guys without firing a shot or even being detected. Now, if you want a firefight, all you have to do is go through the door near the guy to the left and you can shoot it out with these guys. But remember, stealth is the name of the game. So if there's a way to do things sneaky, take it. I think one reason this game threw some people is because the stealthy ways of doing things are a lot more subtle than they were in the previous games. Going through that door is the most obvious way of getting onto the grounds, which means trying to take the one guy out silently and all that. After trying that three times, I decided to look around and see if there was a better way. There was, but I had to hunt for it. The stealth moves aren't as obvious as they used to be, but they're there. And this counts as a stealth move, too. First rule of a fight, never leave your feet. The guys on the ground don't even notice. Whatever Coben is paying him, he needs to get his money back. Inside, we start shooting lights out and moving around. The guards, or goons as the case may be, Know somebody's moving around, but they can't see you. You move into the next couple of rooms and see this guy. Now, something I really like, since I pulled that guy out of the window, which counts as a hand-to-hand, -hand, and took down this guy, I have two mark and execute maneuvers I can use. Yes, they accumulate. Right now, I can only mark two targets at a time, but I can do two now and two more later if I need to. Very nice. Another nice thing is the ability to combine some of your maneuvers. Watch this. Someone was watching. Was that cool or what? This maneuver is also new. Okay, I'm really starting to like this. Then there's the new last known position feature. In other words, they're shooting at where they last saw you. Here's a hint. Be somewhere else. You start making your way downstairs, and along the way, you pick up some EMP grenades. Uh, some what? Well, you can toss them and they'll temporarily shut off the electricity so you can sneak around. Cool. I didn't find them all that useful most of the time, but experiment with them and see what you can do. Then let me know. Here's another new feature, a weapon stash. You earn points for things like hand-to-hand -hand kills, using environmental things like that chandelier, and other challenges. You can then use those points to upgrade weapons and gadgets, and acquire better weapons and gadgets. This seems to be a new trend in games, and I'm still deciding if I like it. When you're as ADD as I am, it can get distracting sometimes. But the ability to upgrade is very nice and really comes in handy. As before, it is what it is, so use it. Have fun, basically just go with it. I have to admit, 
earning points that are useful for something in the game is a lot more interesting than earning achievements that only show up in the Xbox list and are only good for bragging rights. So in that sense, it seems like a good trend that focuses more on the game itself than on the gamer's ego. I can live with that. You catch up with Coben and he won't tell you who he's working for. Interrogation doesn't help. Then he says something really weird. They told him you were coming. Suddenly, the place is overrun with special ops guys who demand that you surrender. Grimm comes on the earpiece and tells you that you need to go with him. Sam reluctantly agrees and they shoot him with a tranquilizer dart. Needless to say, the world goes black. When you wake up, Grimm is talking with the director of Third Echelon. He tells her to interrogate you using any means necessary, chemical or otherwise. He leaves one guy behind to do the dirty work. So, what's the interrogation going to be like? Listen to me. I'm working for President Caldwell as a mole inside Third Echelon. Reed's the new director, and he's working hand-in-hand -hand with our hosts here, a PMC called Black Arrow. They're running a pipeline for stolen Russian EMP tech through Malta, and Reed's stonewalling any kind of investigation into it. Reed's stonewalling the president. He's got serious political coverage from somewhere, and the president isn't getting anywhere through channels. We know they're in the final stages of prep for something very ugly, but what we don't know is what it is or where it's going down. Okay, several things. One, Grimm has put on a lot of weight. Two, she apparently owns stock in an eyeliner company because she's wearing enough for about three people. Third, this isn't much of a shock. Grimm working with the bad guys? I think not. If you're observant, you'll notice there's one little problem, though. Let's look again at Grimm shooting that guy. Uh, where'd the gun come from? I think she's supposed to be pulling it out of that little pouch on the back of her belt, but take a good look at the pouch, then look at the gun. Unless somebody in programming seriously screwed up here, I can only think of one explanation for how she got that gun out of that pouch. It's big on the inside, that's all. So anyway, Sam tries to explain that he's out of this whole game and couldn't care less what government agencies do to each other. Grimm tells him he's still in, and all it took was one little word about Sarah to bring him back in. That pushes Sam's button. I know she's alive. How's that for starters? You're lying. She's dead. Lambert told me she was dead, and I take his word over yours. She's alive, Sam, and I know where she is. I've known all along. You're lying. Why should I believe you? Because my people have her. If you help me, you get to see her again. If you don't, it's out of my hands. She gives you the keys to her car, a snake camera linked to a phone so you can talk to her and eventually talk to Sarah, and a pistol. Now your task is to get some C4, plant it on a helicopter the bad guys have on site, plant more on a satellite dish so they can't visually track Grimm's car, and disrupt the base's power so you can move around more effectively. It's basic game stuff that gets you off the base and on to the next level, but it's a lot of fun. And you can either do it the shoot 'em up way or the stealth way. I like to fiddle with combinations of both. One little cheat that the game gives you when you're dealing with groups of bad guys is well illustrated here. Anybody else? As soon as you take out the last bad guy, Sam makes some wisecrack. You gotta love it. Notice one other thing here that isn't really explained. When you're using the machine gun, you can mark and execute three targets, not the two that you could with the pistol. Different weapons give you different execute numbers. So when you're at a weapon stash, that's one of the things you want to look at. How many executes can this gun do? But they're not called executes, they're called marks. Here's one with three and another with four. You get the idea. You'll want to factor that into your decision about which gun to carry. You plant the C4 on the helicopter, then go disrupt the base's power grid. We've lost power! 
From there, Grimm tells you that you have to plant some more C4 on a satellite dish so they can't track your car visually. Once that's done, you fight your way out the gate, get in the car and take off. In the car, Sam calls a friend. If you're asking for help, we better do this face to face. And what the hell's going on back there? I thought you'd recognize the sound. Remind you of anything? Yeah. I rock. Yo, Sam. How's your little girl? She's doing fine. Well, this is different for Splinter Cell. A flashback. Suddenly, you're in Iraq. Your squad is attacked, and when you wake up, you get word that your squad leader is missing, presumed dead. Whoever's on the radio orders you to stay put and wait for pickup. But, of course, you're not going to do it. You're off to fight your way into a compound and rescue your squad leader. When you get there, you discover something really different. Thank me till we're out of here. When's backup coming? Good question. Wofford Base. This is Husky. I got two for a ride out of here. Whoa! We're not Sam, we're Vic! Okay, that is very cool. Vic, we discover, is the one telling the story. He continues. That op started a change in Sam. One that would take years to really show itself. Years of figuring out what that change meant. But Sam's deal with Grimm meant he needed intel on EMPs and Black Arrow right now. It's time to meet with Vic and learn some things about EMP, about this Black Arrow that Grimm is trying to fight, and everything else. But it's not going to be easy. They're following Vic, so the two of you decide the best place to meet is at the mall in front of the Washington Monument. There's a huge carnival going on, big crowds, it should be easy to get rid of the trackers who are watching Vic in order to grab Sam. Yeah, easy. All you have to do is locate him without them seeing you, and take him out without anybody else seeing any of it. The next level is now in progress. I wasn't following you, I swear! Huh? <laughs> Talk to me about Victor Cost. He's just this guy. I swear. I, I, I don't know anything else. So after you take out the three bad guys, you head to the little building at the base of the Washington Monument and meet Vic. He gives you some information and some new gadgets. There you are. Here, put this on. We don't have a lot of time. Those spotters had to have backup. So we'll go over to basics here, cover the rest by phone. Sounds good. Look in the bag, you'll find your favorite pistol. I didn't get you anything. Shut up, Sam, there's no time. You'll also find something I borrowed from a buddy over at DARPA. It's a portable EMP generator. Low intensity, short range. The bag's shielded so you can stash your gear in there, but, uh... Hit the trigger, you'll fry everything around you to use as juice. Nice. What else do you have for me? Uh, there's a file in the bag, but here's the short version. There's an R&D house called White Box, a DOD contractor that does work on EMP technology. So? So, six months ago, they suddenly contract out all their security to those assholes over at Black Arrow. Now, that's a breaking pattern for them. They don't do corporate security. And based on what you told me about them... There might be a connection. Bingo. It's slim, but you've gone fifth freedom based on less. All right. Time for you to go. And you ping me when you reach safe distance, and we'll talk more about White Box before you go in. Will do. Stay safe, Vic. So now you have to get back to your car, but there's a bazillion cops and who knows what else looking for you under the guise of the ever-popular gas leak. How to get there. Well, that didn't work. Let's try something else. Give it up! 
can't hide from me forever! Show yourself! That's the Sam Fisher way. It's also why I don't understand a lot of the gripes about this game. Yeah, you're using the gun a lot more, but you're still doing it the Splinter Cell way. Use stealth to gain the greatest advantage and take them out one at a time. You take them down one by one the diehard way. Once you get to the car, you get a short clip of being captured by Grimm. This is a little confusing because you actually have to make Sam walk down the hall to get the next part of the story. Once you do, Vic starts telling the tale again. Your next stop is White Box Laboratories to see if you can track down information about their connection to the Black Arrow group. Getting in is convoluted, of course, but not unbelievable. I made my way to the security office, shooting out lights as I went, but there are several ways you can do it. Once there, you find three guys with guns in the office. I decided to take care of them with one of my remote bombs just for fun. I'll stay here and keep an eye out. <sighs> that was enjoyable. So, you access the security cameras and find out that the scientists are terrified of the new so-called management. And judging by this, they have good reason to be. I'm going to tell Lucius Galliard that you are interfering in our work. What do you think about that? You hear that? I did. But what he doesn't realize... ...is that we work for Galliard too. One of the security guys grabs a woman scientist and drags her away. Suddenly, your mission is to rescue the scientist who's left. Off you go. Once you take down the bad guys guarding him, he tells you the guy in charge of all this is named Robertson. So you need to get to Robertson's server so Grimm can tap into it and find out what his big plan for all this EMP bomb stuff is. On the way, Grimm lets you have a short conversation with Sarah. Yes, she's alive. Third Echelon had told her that Sam was dead, so they played both of you. Now Sam is really furious. Somebody is going to pay big time for this, but first things first. The scientist gets you into an elevator that's supposed to get you to where Robertson's computer is. You make your way there and install a back door for Grimm, but you can't leave yet. She needs to download everything on the system, but bad guys are coming and they could break the link. If they do, she can't get back in. Um. Uh, why can't you just take him out and then re-establish the link? Uh, wow. So anyway, this will take several tries because these guys come from everywhere. Luke, go, go, go! I was at the monument fish. Ah! Ah! Don't you hide from me! Of course, there's no rest for Sam after this. Somebody started a trace on her connection, and if they manage to complete it, then both Grimm and Sarah are in danger. So you have to stop the trace by any means necessary. The most effective way is to set off one of their EMP bombs, because it'll fry everything in the building. Back downstairs you go, fight past more bad guys, and set off the bomb. You think you can stay dead forever? Okay. 
Once out of there, you have to track down a fellow named Louis Galliard. He's some kind of big shot, and Tom Reed, the new head of Third Echelon, is apparently in his back pocket. They're meeting at the Lincoln Memorial, and for a change, you're not fighting your way through a bunch of bad guys. The vice president has just made a speech, so there are cameras all over the place. You're supposed to take control of them and record the conversation between Galliard and Reed. To do that, you have to figure out which cameras to switch to and keep them zeroed in on the two men. We can talk about Black Arrow shortcomings later. I want to talk about what I need to make this go off smoothly. Do you now? I was impressed that he said that. What did you think of Samson's speech? It was a nice piece of grandstanding. He should give it... <laughs> Plays well for the folks back home. I don't like the chance. You don't like Samson. I don't trust Samson. But if you had a better tool, I'd be using it. Which is, incidentally, something you should keep in mind. My, my, are you actually threatening me? I thought we were both more civilized than that. This is what your people want. The people I represent want you to deal with Fisher. Stop wasting time. Stop wasting their money. If Megiddo's getting cold feet... Let, let me make this clear, Reed. Megiddo planned this operation. It might take a few tries to get it all because there's no real pattern to the camera switching, but it's interesting. They make some oblique references to an operation, and Grimm tells Sam to go interrogate Galliard. You do that, and he tells you there's some organization called Megiddo behind it all, and there are three EMP bombs planted around the D.C. area. Sam asks where they are, and Galliard doesn't know, and he's not going to get a chance to find out. Megiddo. Who are they? They're the ones who run this town, in Moscow, in Beijing, and any other place that matters. <laughs> They're the ones who are going to get me out of this one piece. And once Reed is finished at the white... Ah! That's all Reed down. Officer in trouble! Sam. Now it's a race. You have to chase the shooter all over the place, find paths through tents and vehicles and who knows what else, deal with some cops without killing any of them, and when you finally catch up with him... Sam, are you alright? Sorry. Put it into practice. Oh well, so much for that lead. To make matters worse, Third Echelon has told the cops to pull back, and they've sent in death squads to take you out. So you have to fight through them to get back to your car. But now you know that Tom Reed is behind at least some of this plot that involves jerking you around and endangering your daughter. So Sam is off the Third Echelon headquarters. They're convinced that he can't get in, but of course he can. Grimm tells him not to be detected, which includes some security cameras. Now. In the olden days of Splinter Cell, you could just shoot the camera and all would be well. Not today. Shoot the cameras, you get mission failure. Oh well, it was nice while it lasted. And you can't knock guards out with a sticky camera anymore either, because these don't spray gas, they explode. Basically, you can't use any of your gadgets because one way or another, somebody is going to detect it and put the building into lockdown. So you have to do it the old-fashioned way. What's your location? Damn! Ugh. Forget it, Sam. They know you're there and the building's going into lockdown. Here's a place where it gets weird. Several times I had to listen to these two guards talk, then try to figure out what to do with the one that comes my way. As you saw, I managed to kill him, but the mission ended because he sounded an alarm. Now, with the mission starting over, I have to do it again, right? Wrong. He's gone. He never appears again. Well, that's good, I guess, even if it does appear to be a glitch. But it gets better. Watch this. I 
went down the line and shot out every light in this parking level and the next one. The first task is to plant C4 on two power transformers to keep the place running. You find the right place behind a door and go in after you shoot out the light over it. After you plant the first one, you can come back out that door. Hey, wait a minute. The light's back on. Whoa. Every single one of the lights I shot out is back on. That's one hell of a maintenance crew. To be fair, I had a mission failure there right after I planted the first C4 charge, and the game restarted at the point where I was getting ready to exit the room. Still, since I had a solid save point there, it should have recorded that I took out those lights. Sloppy people. Very sloppy. I expect better than this out of a Splinter Cell game. As far as I know, when Sam shoots out a light bulb, it doesn't grow back. At least by the time I get the second charge planted, I've taken care of all the guards, so there's no... Okay, where the hell did he come from? And of course, once you restart, all the lights are back on. This part is very poorly done. There's no indication that more guards are coming, and really, they're not even supposed to know that you're there. So why would Third Echelon send more guards to the parking garage for no good reason? And seriously, where did they come from? They just appeared there. Again, I expect a lot better than this from a Splinter Cell game. Then again, there was the Shanghai version of Double Agent, so maybe... Oh crap, now I'm getting a headache. Let's move on. Once you've planted the two C4 charges, you head into the front desk holding the detonator. It's going to get really intense here, so we're going to stop for now and pick it up next week. Until then, I'm Irving, and I have no life, just like you. Well, finally, Irving got three slugs in the belly. It was right outside the Frontier Deli. <laughs> he was sitting there twirling his gun around, and Butterfingers Irving gunned himself down. Irving. Big fat Irving. Big Dum Dum Irving. Big Dum Dum Dead Irving. The 142nd fastest gun in the West. <laughs>